This morning, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Judges. We'll be covering chapters 10, 11, and 12. The title of the lesson this morning is Jephthah's Life of Tears. Now, for those that are just joining us this morning, just a reminder that the period of Judges lasted from the death of Joshua until the kingship of Saul. And so it covers the books of Judges, Ruth, and the first several chapters of 1 Samuel. There are probably two verses that I think stand out that describe the condition of Israel in that day. The very last verse of the book of Judges in Judges 21-25 says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And of course it's double and gender right there in the sense that they didn't have a physical king, but the real issue was God was not king in Israel. Secondly, in 1 Samuel 3, 1, it says, In those days the word of the Lord was read, and there were not many visions, there were not many dreams. Sadly, those two verses describe not only those days, but these days spiritually. The word of the Lord is rare at this hour, and there are not many dreams. I hope that today we're going to get on our spiritual seatbelts. Because we're going to cover three chapters, and we're going to get into the Word of God, I think, in an exciting way. Let's get to chapter 10 of the book of Judges. Right here we find at the beginning the judgeship of two men, Tola and Jair. Now, both of these guys ruled Israel, one for 23 years, the next for 22 years. And basically, there was no issue of occupation. So there was kind of a, a lull, if you will, in this period in the time of Judges. But then we read in verse 6 these words. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Asterisks and the gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab. And Israel forsook the Lord and no longer served him. He became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan and Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. And Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We've sinned against you, forsaking a God and serving the Baals. Okay, let's just stop right here. We find that there's kind of a law under the judgeships of Tola and Jair. And yet all of a sudden, I mean, things begin to happen. The Bible, and I love the word right here, just in verse 6, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And remember the cycle that we've studied out so far in the book of Judges. It's a very simple one. Israel goes into disobedience. That leads to darkness. That leads to distress. And then they cry out to the divine who sends the deliverer. And, of course, during the lifetime of the deliverer, Israel is returned to the worship of Jehovah. But then he dies, and the cycle again goes back. To disobedience. And so we find the beginning of that cycle right here. Now it's kind of interesting. We find not only is there one invasion at this time, but I mean they're being invaded. Israel's being invaded by the Philistines from the south, by Moab from the east, and by the Arameans from the north. I mean, it's a massive invasion that God has brought upon these people. And it's very interesting right here. We see in verse 7, he sold them in the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crush them. Man, you get shattered and crushed, and haven't we all been there, amen? And obviously, in that distress, you're going to turn to the Lord. But look, look what happens right here. The Lord replies in verse 11, When the Egyptians, the Amorites, and the Ammonites, the Philistines, Sidonians, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? He reminds them of what had happened in the past. Of course, with the Egyptians, remember the Exodus. With the Amorites, remember Numbers chapter 21. With the Ammonites, remember back to Ehud. Remember the judge there? They were, they were in alliance right then with the Midianites. And he says, don't you remember what's happened in the past? And he says, didn't I save you? Verse 13. But you have forsaken me and served other gods. So I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. Now, we have a little bit more detail right here. The people of Israel in distress. They're crying out to divine. They're crying out to God. They say, please save us. 
He says, no, you guys have chosen your own way. Now look what he says. Verse 15. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of their foreign gods amongst them and served the Lord. And he could bear Israel's misery no longer. Our first point is the pain of sin. The pain of sin brings tears, does it not? Israel was in tears. They were in great distress by all these invasions that were coming in on them. And they turned to God and they start praying to God. God, please save us. He goes, no way. No way. You've chosen your gods. Because what does God expect? Only in verse 15 when they say, we have sinned, when they confess their sin. And then they say, do with us whatever you think is best. A total surrender to God. And then in verse 16, it says, then they got rid of their foreign gods and served the Lord. You see, until there is confession and repentance, there is no forgiveness. And yet we bring so much pain, so much tears on ourselves. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Right here, Paul talks about the pain that he brought upon disciples. Can you believe it? He brought pain to disciples. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you proved yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Paul says, I know when I wrote those strong things to you and I confronted you with your sin, it made you sad. It hurt you. He says, but I'm glad. He says, but we need a gut check right here. Was your sadness a worldly sorrow, but you felt bad about your sin, but you weren't going to change? Or was it a godly sorrow where there was a repentance that led to life? And he says, here's what godly sorrow looks like. He says, first of all, there's got to be an earnestness. He says, you know that when you repent. There's an earnestness to deal with your sins. There's an eagerness to clear yourselves. There's an indignation about the sin itself. See, there's no way you can repent of a sin until you confess it. Why? Because you've got to know what your sin is. You've got to know what your sin is. And then you bring it to the Lord. And you bring it to your brothers. And you say, here is where I've sinned. And there's a sense of total surrender to God. You know, I remember a few years ago, I was working with uh, a, a, a man that was married to a new disciple. His name was Gary, and he was uh, in his 40s. And... Uh, at first, he wasn't too interested, but he started coming to church, and he got more and more interested. And he and I always like to sing at the end of church, uh, Stand in Awe. That was, that was his favorite song, <laughs> because he came from such a godless background. Well, what was exciting was, is we started studying, and the other thing that he enjoyed, and we, we both lived in uh, the beach cities, we'd always go for a walk, either before the study or after the study. And we'd talk, and we'd talk, and... We were making a lot of progress, and then all of a sudden, the, the studies kind of flatlined, like we weren't making any progress. And I felt kind of this, this hardness come on into him. You ever been in a study like that? And, 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 and then, and then I, I saw the joy that he had start to dissipate. He started to miss a couple of services then. And I tried to get in there, and we, we went for a few more walks. And finally, I mean, I, I came to his house. We had this really hard study. And he says, Kip, can we go for our walk tonight? There's something I've got to share with you. So he walked down to Manhattan Beach, and he says, can we go out on the pier? And I go, well, yeah, let's, let's go out on the pier. So Gary and I went on out on the pier. He says, you know something? I've been really wrestling with this one last sin that's held me back from becoming a disciple. And he takes out of his, his pocket this giant bag of marijuana. So I'm there on, on the pier with Gary with this giant bag of marijuana. And he goes, this is what has stopped me from becoming a disciple. I love my sin. 
And he says, I want to, I want to get rid of it. And I'm going, okay, let's go. <laughs> Time to deal with it. He says, I just want to tell you. And he just holds it out like this. I want, you know, I have learned to hate this. I go, amen, let's, let's dump. <laughs> and he says, I, I just didn't want to really confess you. Because, number one, I didn't know if you'd really love me. If you knew what I was really like. And then, to be honest with you, I didn't know if I really wanted to change. And I knew if I was going to become a true Christian, a disciple, I would have to learn to hate my sin, that which I loved. And so I want to get rid of it. And I go, okay, let's, let's go, let's go. And then he opens the bag and he lets it fly on out. And you know something? There was such an earnestness. There was such an eagerness. There was a sense of surrender. He would do anything, go anywhere, do anything for the Lord. And he was baptized two days later. Amen, guys? You know, there are some of us right now that have been studying. And we are in the pain of our sin. Because we love our sin. That's why we keep our sin. There are some of us that are disciples. That are holding on to our sin. As a matter of fact, we even say, oh man, I've been hurt. Well, Paul said, you know, sometimes there is a little pain that goes into discipling. You know what I'm talking about right here? He says, but it's not, a, it's not an unloving thing. It's a loving thing because we care more about the person's soul than the person's feelings. And we've got to understand as disciples that we have been called, not just that when we get in a bad situation, to call out in our distress to God, there's got to be a confession of sin. And there's got to be a repentance to show the fruit of that repentance. Amen, guys? Let's get back to our text in the book of Judges. That's very interesting, this next part. Chapter 10, verse 17. When the Ammonites were called to arms and camped at Gilead... The Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. Okay, we got to stop right here, have a little geography lesson. Okay, guys? Right. Now, Gilead is, of course, a very interesting character in the Bible. His, great, great, his great-grandfather was Joseph, who had a son named Manasseh, who had a son named Machar, who had a son named Gilead. And so when the tribes were divided, there was, of course, the tribe of Manasseh. In this case, the half-tribe of Manasseh. And not only was the promised land divided by the tribes, but also by the families. And so inside of Manasseh was a part of it called Gilead. Now in time, Gilead became so dominant, perhaps because of the account that we're about to read, that all of the Transjordan tribes became known as Gilead. Okay? As a matter of fact, at this particular time, the Bible says that the Ammonites had come into this small section of Manasseh called Gilead, and the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. Mizpah was, so to speak, the the main stronghold of the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan. It means watchtower. And uh, there are different names for it. They call it Ramoth uh, Mizpah, which just means on the height there's a watchtower. And so it's up sort of in the northeast corner of the Transjordan tribes right there, pretty close to Syria, modern-day Syria. And we find right here that the Ammonites have come on into Gilead. Now the leaders of Gilead come together, and they call it a little bit loose right here about the leaders of Israel because we know that the tribes of Israel now are very autonomous, very isolated, and so Israel is used very loosely. And we find in verse 18, the leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head of all those living in Gilead. See, they believe in earning the right to lead. Amen, guys? Now read on. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get in here to Zar family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob. 
where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. Okay, let's just stop right here. This is, this is an interesting guy. We find the Bible says right here that Jephthah, the Gileadite, became a mighty warrior. This was while he was living in Gilead. It digresses. He says his father was Gilead. Now, we have two thoughts, two schools of thought. One is that his dad actually was named Gilead. Most people don't think so. This is just a general term. Why? Because his mom was a prostitute. And because of a later reference, we realize that she is not of the Jewish faith. She's a foreigner. And it kind of shows just how far Israel had gotten from God. You, you see what I'm saying right here? And so to speak, then, Gilead, the men of the town, the men of that particular part of Manasseh, because of just visiting the prostitute, somebody had impregnated her. And so his father was, so to speak, Gilead. Do you see what I'm saying right here? And so he goes on down, and he says right here, going on down, he says in verse 3, So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob. Now, Tob is not in Manasseh. It's not in Israel, so to speak. It's in Syria, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. So he becomes this mighty warrior with a bunch of wild-eyed guys, hot-tempered guys, adventurers, who gather around him. These are non-Jews. Read on. Verse 4. Sometime later, when the Ammonites made war on Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, and be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. And Jephthah said, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why did you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said, well, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us and fight the Ammonites, and you will be our head over all who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness, and we will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them, and he repeated all of his words before the Lord at Mizpah. So at Mizpah, he becomes judge and commander of the armies right here. Amen, guys? Now, let's, let's think about his life. The second point is the pain of an eerie past. The pain of an eerie past. His mom was not a Jew. She was a prostitute. He did not know who his dad was. So to speak, his brothers, and we know that's larger than just one family because of the reference right down here where it talks about, in verse 7, Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? So it included all of the elders of Gilead right there. So we see it wasn't just one little tiny family. He says, all of you drove me. Can you imagine? Here he is. He's got a dad he doesn't know. His mom's a prostitute who's not a Jew. And now everybody in town wants to get rid of him. Perhaps because he's a threat, he'd become such a powerful warrior. Can you imagine all the hurt that involves? All the pain of rejection? Have you ever felt rejection from people that you love? From family members? From friends? Then you know exactly the depth of pain. And of course, if some of you, if you don't know who your dad is, then... There's a tremendous amount of pain right there. This man lived his life in pain. Tears were a part of his life. Now, he tries to make the best of it. He, he becomes a mighty warrior. He gathers a group of adventurers around him. You know, I think so often we think that if we have an eerie past, we can't do anything great for God. And, you know, if you were to list who the great men of God are, you'd have to include Jephthah. Why? Because God included him in Hebrews chapter 11. He's included along with Abel. He's included along with Abraham and Moses. He is in the list of the heroes of faith. So we know that even if you have an eerie past, you can do great things for God. Are you with me right here? You know, when I, when I, when I think of people that have overcome a tremendously difficult past... I think of uh, two people that are very close to Elena and myself, and that's uh, Michael and Michelle Williamson. And I, I, I talked to Michael and see if I could share the following things with you. He says, fine, I just shared it in the class at the seminar, so don't worry about it. It's on tape. You know, Michael comes from a different, very difficult past. He doesn't know his dad. His mom was in drugs, and she abandoned Michael and his brothers, and he had to be the one to raise his brothers as a teenager. He got into all kinds of sin. He says, I got into immorality from my loneliness in the drugs because I just wanted to numb myself out. Well, all of this, in that distress, Michael turns to God. 
he becomes a disciple. Is that awesome? See, sometimes we, we need to understand that the stress in our life is the cause us to turn to God. Well, a lot of times we think we become a disciple and now there's no more pain. Three weeks after he becomes a disciple, he goes to jail. Say, what happened? Well, he was working for a lady. And unbeknownst to him, this lady had a son that was in the church. And she hated the church. And when Michael came to her and says, listen, I need my Sundays off. She says, no, 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 no. <laughs> You've got to come and work for me. Michael says, no, I, I've got to have my Sundays off. Well, he was looking for another job. And he told her, I'm not coming this Sunday. He didn't come. And lo and behold, that next week, he had officers come. said, we just had a report on you from your employer. And you have a previous record. And the agreement was that if your employer does not employ you or is not happy with you, you will go to jail. And so three weeks after he becomes a disciple, he goes to jail for two months. Is that intense? Now, that's an eerie past. Amen. Well, interestingly enough, he later marries Michelle. Now, Michelle had a very difficult past. One of the things that was just so painful about her past, and, and she shared this publicly, is that she was sexually abused by her father. And she says not only was that just gross and hurting, but one of the most difficult memories that she has that haunts her sadly to this day. And sometimes we do have scars of our sins and other people's sins. Haunts her to this day is she could hear her father sexually molesting her sister through the wall. It's just it's in her mind. She grew up. She got married. A failed marriage. And then she became a disciple. Well, Michael and Michelle were brought together by the Lord. Two years ago, they were given a little Bible talk in Vancouver, which is part of Portland. They had six disciples. Now, two years later, there are 34 disciples in the Vancouver ministry. Are you with me right here? Is that incredible? See, we can overcome. We can do great things no matter what our past is. Are you with me right here? And so now we see Jephthah being raised up by God to be the judge and the commander of the armies of Israel. And we see that he's brought to Mizpah to take this oath. Okay, now let's see what happens. Verse 12, chapter 11. Then Jephthah sent messages to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against us that you have attacked our country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's messengers. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. Jephthah sent back the messages to the Ammonite king saying, and here's what he said. He said, now that's not true. What happened was when the Israelites came up out of Egypt, they purposely stayed away from all engagements until they got to Sion and Sion said, listen, I'm not only not going to let you go through my land, I'm going to attack you. So in a defensive posture, the Israelites battle against Sihon, they defeat him. Now, the Amorites had taken the Ammonites' land. I hope you can follow all that along right there. And so the Ammonite king was saying, hold it, this was our land. And Jephthah goes, absolutely not. God gave it to us. Sihon conquered you, and we conquered him, and that land is ours by the hand of God. Now, let's see how the king of Ammon took all of that. Verse 28. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Well, there you go. Amen. <laughs> Verse 29. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from there he advanced against the Ammonites. Okay, so what he's doing right now is he's collecting his army as he goes through. Verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house, to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Now, you got to understand, Gilead, from one respect, is a very tiny part of Manasseh. He has become the leader of what's left of Israel in the Transjordan side. There are not that many troops, and now he's going against a very powerful army. And all the way through the Scriptures... The pagan kings, when they got to a desperate situation, they'd make a vow to their God and say, I will sacrifice my son, my firstborn son, if you give me the victory. Let's read on. Verse 32. 
Then Jephthah went out to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aor to the vicinity of Minna, as far as abel Kerim. Thus Israel subdued Amnon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter dancing to the sound of tambourines? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter, you've made me miserable and wretched because I've made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, You have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and the girls went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father. And he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite custom that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Number three, the pain of a vow. The pain of a vow. You know, in the last couple of centuries, there has been every attempt made to explain away What Martin Luther says is very clear in the text. All the church fathers for the first ten centuries of Christianity said Jephthah killed his daughter in fulfillment of the vow. There is not one that disagrees. It's very interesting, and I think if we take a step back from the text, we can understand the setting a little bit better. Number one, we understand that Jephthah was not raised by a Jewish mom. He is raised by a mom, and he had no dad, by a mom that worshipped pagan gods. He then leaves for modern-day Syria, Tob, of the Armenians. Now, the Armenians, the Moabites, and the Philistines all practiced human sacrifices. For him, this was not a strange teaching. Shockingly, even for the Jews, we kind of overlook it. But Abraham himself was called to the mountain to sacrifice his son. And if not for the angel of God, his son would have been a human sacrifice. Very interestingly, in the Hebrew, when it says that he prayed, I will give the first thing that meets me, that phrase is used five different times in the Old Testament. It's used in Genesis 14, Genesis 24, Exodus 4, Numbers 20, and 1 Samuel 25. In every case, it's used to meet another human being. It wasn't that his daughter comes out of the house and, oh, now now I've got to offer a human sacrifice. No, 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 no. He already had set his mind on a human sacrifice, and it happened to be his daughter. And the Bible says right here, and shocking it seems, he kept his vow and his daughter was submissive to it. Why? Because she was raised for most of her life in Tob. It was not uncommon to have that as their mindset, that to gain the favor of the God, there'd have to be human blood that would be spilt. Now what comes to me is that we in our generation... Keeping a vow has become cheap. We take a marriage vow. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Forsaking all others. Until death do us part. How cheap it's become. Right now, if a young person gets married in the world, over 50% chance they're going to get a divorce. But now... That kind of cheapness to our words and our vow has even crept into the Lord's church. And the unthinkable has begun. Divorces in God's church. What's the only explanation? People have been unfaithful to their vow to God. You know, many of us have come back from the Jubilee, and we had a cranking time at the Jubilee. Amen, guys? And I don't care who you are. You you know, you come out of every Jubilee, and you go, hold it. I am going to change this about my life. 
We did make those kind of decisions, right, guys? Amen. Have you kept your vow just seven days later? What radical decisions did you make? Have you kept it? Or have your words become so cheap that in seven days' time you fail to follow through on what you committed to God? You know, it's sad to see the cheapening of our vow. As much as we value the vow to our spouse, we have the ultimate vow, Jesus is Lord. And how cheap that's become. So cheap. Jesus, Lord, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. People are not putting God and his church first. It's nothing to miss Sunday. It's nothing to miss a midweek. There's no focus. Why? Because the vow has been cheapened. And when we see brothers and sisters get weak like this, the sad part is it's even come to us that we don't even follow up on people like that. And it's been even called wrong to follow up when somebody misses church. How far we've drifted. Now let me tell you something. If someone missed dinner at your family dinner, one of your kids, you're not going to go, okay, well, Junior's not here. Let's just go ahead and eat. I don't care where he's at. You know, where's Junior at? We're not eating until Junior gets down here. Go find him. Amen, guys? How much more so in the church when we're a spiritual family if someone missed church? Now, they may miss church because of sickness. They may miss church because of some legitimate reason. But very often, people miss church because they've grown weak in their faith. And they need someone to come in love and get them to remember the vow they've made to God. Are you with me right here? You know, we've got some challenges that we're going to be addressing in just a couple of weeks at our congregational devotional. And I really want to put them before you so that we can have some hard-line decisions. Number one, we're calling every single member that's not taking first principles in Portland to take first principles. Because we need to get the first principles of God's Word down. Amen, guys? That's going to be a challenge. Now, babysitting will be provided, and that will be all nice and good. And the dates will be given to you, and we'll be talking more about that in the next couple of weeks. But we need to make sure that we have the first principles down so that we can go on to maturity. Amen? Secondly, we're going to talk about our contribution. Even now, some of us have said, okay, I'm giving a tithe to the Lord, but if things get tight, well, I just don't have it this week, and I had to pay this. How cheap is your words? Some, you've come into the church and said, yes, I've had to deal with greed that's come into my life. I've had to deal with all sorts of things and, that have come, but you've not made the radical steps of repentance. To put God first over your will. You know, one of the people that's uh, going to be moving here in just uh, about 10 days is Jay and Nan- A- Angie Hernandez. And they're awesome because Jay was a teacher in Portland. And he wanted to go in the ministry. And there's a price to everything. And he was living in this beautiful four-bedroom house, house in Hillsboro, beautiful yard. And he says, I know i got to get training. Kip, what do I need to do? I said, bro, we got to spend time together then. He says, well, all I can think of is I've got to move in a lot closer to city center where you live. And so Jay sold his beautiful house out in the country and moved to a two-bedroom facility. And he has two little boys and, of course, his wife. And he made that sacrifice, and now he's in the full-time ministry. See, a lot of us have forgotten that we're to use our money for God. Everything we've given for God. See, but we rationalize, well, I just don't have money now. Hey, it's time to die on size. It's time to deal with greed. It's time to deal with paneling our houses when the temple of the Lord is gone unfinished. Are you with me right here, guys? See, we've we've got to be reminded the pain of a vow. When you take a vow, you follow through with it, no matter what the pain. Are you with me here, church? Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. Chapter 12. Confronting compounding pains. So in other words, Jephthah's going to go through even more pain right now. Let's watch it. Verse 1. The men of Ephraim called out their forces, crossed over to Zaphron, and said to Jephthah, 
Why did you go out to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. Now that's encouraging from your brothers, isn't it? You remember the Ephraimites? They're the same dudes that gave Gideon trouble. But this is this prideful tribe that says, man, why didn't you call us to go out and fight? Because we, you didn't do that. Because we didn't fight with you. We are going to burn down your house. Now that was a very common practice, as we'll see in our next lesson about Samson. Let's read what happened, so. Verse 2. Jephthah so answered, I and my people were engaged in a great struggle with the Ammonites, and although I called, oh my goodness, there was another side to the story. Can you believe that? Wow. If you would have listened to the Ephraimites, you'd have said, well, Jephthah, yeah, why didn't you call them out? And Jephthah goes, you know, when I called you out, even though I was involved in a great struggle, we pick it up, you didn't save me out of their hands. When I saw that you wouldn't help, I took my life in my hands and crossed over to fight the Ammonites. And the Lord gave me a victory over them. Now, why have you come up today to fight me? See, they came on up to pick a fight. You know, one of the worst fights that, that, that we can have is with someone we love. And right here, there's a fight between Israelites, between brothers. So in the midst of the pain that he has growing up, the midst of being rejected and all the tears that must have brought, the midst of a vow that he had to keep where he literally kills his daughter as a sacrifice for the victory. In the midst of this now is a compounding pain is now his brothers are against him. Let's read what happens. Verse 4. Jephthah then called together the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. The Gileadites struck them down because the Ephraimites had said, you Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. Now you remember, a lot of the guys that were with Jephthah probably weren't even Jews. A lot of his generals were probably foreigners that he used in the Israelite army. He says, you guys are a bunch of renegades. Verse 5. The Gileadites captured the fords of Jordan leading to Ephraim. And whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked him, are you an Ephraimite? If he replied no, they said, all right, say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth, because he couldn't pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the fords of the Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. You've got to watch your words. You know, it's very interesting. The word Shibboleth means an ear of corn or flood. Sibboleth means burden. And oh, what a burden if you could not pronounce Shibboleth. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting. In World War II, the U.S. soldiers tested some of the Japanese bilinguals. And they asked the Japanese person to pronounce the word Lollapalooza. And because the Japanese have a tendency to make their L's R, they go, aha! The Nazis did the same thing with the Russian Jews, using the word kukuruza, which means chicken. And once more, they had difficulty pronouncing the word. Some of us attempt to speak Spanish. <laughs> and we have difficulty rolling our R's. And so you can always tell a real Spanish speaker from a fake one. Are you with me right here, guys? We understand the test. We understand the test. You know, it's interesting. Here's what Wikipedia says. A shibboleth is any language usage indicative of one's social or regional origin coming from the dialect. Because you see, the Ephraimites did not have the sound SH in their vocabulary, in their derelict. Or more broadly, any term that identifies the members of a group. That is a shibboleth. Now, the first century Christians had shibboleths. What were their shibboleths? Well, Christian. That was what they were. Now, it wasn't a name... They gave themselves. 
So the name Outsiders gave him. The Way. First century Christians were called The Way. Now, you know, we have shibboleths in our movement. The shibboleth is sold out. That's a shibboleth. It's, it's an identifying word. Another shibboleth is evangelizing the world in a generation. It's a shibboleth. It's identity. Now, in the midst of each shibboleth comes a temptation to get arrogant about your identification. See, a lot of people are afraid of lines. Lines are going to be there. There are lines. It's what we do with lines that is the issue. The word sold out, I think, is a great word. It just talks about giving everything to the Lord, and that's what it means when you say, Jesus is Lord. It doesn't mean to be perfect, or otherwise none of us would be sold out. Amen, guys? And in one sense, how can we say that Jesus is Lord and we're all sinners? I mean, Marty made a great uh, opening today. Is that, hey, surprise, you're not in a perfect church. And yet, all of us that are members here say, Jesus is Lord. Amen, church? So we understand that the word sold out does not carry with it perfection. But a sense of commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, the temptation can be for those of us that claim to be sold out to feel like we're the only ones. And there comes the line that's necessary. What we're trying to do here in this congregation is to build a church where the call is in response to Jesus Christ dying on the cross for everybody to be sold out disciples. Our motivating vision is to evangelize the world in this generation. But we don't believe that we're the only ones that are sold out disciples. The Bible says that if you make Jesus Lord and you become a disciple and you're baptized for remission of sin, you have become saved. I believe there are a lot of saved people in the ICOC, in the mainline Church of Christ, Christian Church. And sadly, because of lukewarmness that's come into many churches, there's even been a drifting of disciples into denominational churches that do not preach what God teaches about salvation. Now, why? Because they're saying, well, you know, I'd rather have the spirit than the right doctrine. No, 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 no. We've got to have both spirit and doctrine. Are you with me right here? We've got to have both. Now, we as disciples need to understand that, hey, we cannot be judgmental about someone outside of our movement. But we need to understand that there needs to be a movement of disciples because that's how it was in the first century in order to evangelize the world in a generation. And our goal is to get as many people as possible with us. Some have even accused us of recruiting. Absolutely. I want everybody to join us in evangelizing the world. I'm unapologetic about it. I, I want people to enjoy the rich fellowship. I want people to enjoy the heavenly singing. I want people to enjoy true discipling relationships where people really care about you. I want people to enjoy seeing baptisms. I want people to enjoy seeing people restored unto the Lord. Are you with me right here, guys? And, and we, we cannot be ashamed of who we are. We cannot be ashamed of what we believe because it's in the Word of God. Are you with me right here? And so, whether you like the term sold out is really immaterial. The issue is, are you going to be sold out? <laughs> That's the issue. And we, with this shibboleth, do not draw a line where God has not drawn a line. There are other people that are saved outside this fellowship. But I believe this fellowship is unique in that we individually and collectively call every single person to be a sold-out disciple. Yeah. We sit down with every person that's baptized and we study through with them. Yeah. they got to be a, a sold-out, baptized disciple. Right, Gabe? Amen? Yeah. Every person that's restored, we sit down. We start looking at Luke 15 and the prodigal son. And we say, hey, God is coming to get you. God loves you, but we don't compromise the, for the commitment that's involved. Even with people that place membership, like Robert and Grace, they're awesome people. They're incredible people. But Robert's own testimony says, man, my faith was getting weak. I'd even thought about quitting God. Now, he was still hanging in there. 
But we had to grab them on in. Are you with me right here? And now I really believe that because they're reconnected to God and they're in a fellowship that really loves one another, they are going to do even more for the Lord. Are you with me right here, guys? But we cannot be apologetic or ashamed of the shibboleths that define our fellowship. Are you with me right here? You know, I'm really excited about the things that are happening in Santiago, Chile. About two and a half years ago, Raul and Linda Moreno came to Portland and asked Elena and myself to disciple them because they saw the Portland church still practicing discipling, making the changes that we need to learn from the past, but still practicing discipling, multiplying disciples. And they came to say, man, this is what we want in Santiago because they'd stopped having evangelistic Bible talks like most of all of our fellowship had. And they came, we called them back to it, they saw, and we started discipling them. We discipled them for two years, and then when we announced the beginning of a new movement, the sold-out movement, they said, listen, we don't want to be partnered with you anymore. Elaine and I went down, we talked to them in the church, but they said, no, we're going to cut it. We do not believe there's the need for a new movement. Our words with them were just simply, well, amen, we're really disappointed, we're a bit hurt, but we wish you all the best. We weren't going to draw a line of fellowship against them. They're disciples. Well, time went on, and Raul's been reading our website every week on it. And the one that really hit him was movement or fellowship. And he says, that haunted me. About a month ago, I get a phone call. This is after not hearing from Raul for about, I don't know, 10 months. He goes, bro, this is Raul. Raul who? Raul Mourinho, I mean, you know, your brother. I go, hey, Raul, how are you doing? He said, well, bro, I don't know where to start, but basically you're right about everything. I see what's happened in South America. The churches are isolated in their autonomy, and they're going and drifting in all different ways. There's no movement. There's no hope for South America unless there is a movement. Now I understand. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, bro, I'm going to call my church back to being a group of sold-out disciples in a movement that God is propelling. He did this past week, and we now have a new church in Santiago, Chile. Amen, guys? See, we've got to be willing. We've got to be willing to take a stand for the truth and not apologize for it. It's great to be a sold-out disciple for Jesus Christ. But it'll bring more pain. Because sometimes you'll even find yourself Not on your part, but in your brother's part, fighting you. Let's go to our last verse. Chapter 12, verse 7. Jephthah led Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gideonite died and was buried in the town in Gilead. Jephthah only led Israel six years, and then he died. My last point is the end of pain. The end of pain. No one's ever said it. No commentator is absolute about it. But I believe that Jephthah's short life was because of all the pain. In death, he found his peace. You know, for a lot of us that are disciples, we carry a false sense of what Christianity is all about. We think once we come out of the waters of baptism, no more pain, no more suffering, no more hard times. Well, let's go to one of our heroes in the faith and let's see what happened with Paul when he was considering getting baptized. Acts chapter 9. You remember how the Lord had to convince Ananias to go share his faith with Paul? You remember that? Because Ananias had to remind God, says, you know, this is the guy that's killing all the Christians. God says, just go. Amen. <laughs> and we read this in verse 15. Chapter 9 of Acts. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's before he got baptized. He says, Ananias, I want you to go teach this guy 
saw, later known as Paul, more completely about Jesus. And when you go, tell him he's got a destiny. It's a great destiny. He is going to be the vehicle that I use to take my message to all the world, to all the Gentiles. And he will take my message to the kings and the most prominent people of that generation. And I will show him how much he must suffer. And that's before he got baptized. No wonder he was a little hesitant there in Acts 22. And Ananias goes, and now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Hey, dude, hold it. When I get baptized, the suffering begins. And this is why a lot of Christians lose their faith. They don't understand. Suffering for Jesus begins at baptism. We think if we're suffering, something's wrong. Now, when you suffer, something's right. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. In verse 33, Jesus says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day has enough pain of its own. See, a lot of us are paralyzed by the pains in our lives. Maybe a tough marriage situation. Maybe a tough situation with the kids. Maybe a tough financial situation. Maybe a tough job situation. Maybe health. Maybe aging. But as disciples, Jesus, listen, you're to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness first. It's just deal with each day. Don't worry. You know, I was, I was with a really great couple last night. And I'm not going to mention the Wooten's name, for that would, that would reveal who they were. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, you look at the Wootens, you go, wow, pillars in the faith. People that have endured through the ages. Mighty warriors. And that they are. Amen. But so last night we, we got together. And both Elena and myself and them opened up about the pains in our lives. And see, people think, man, look at them. They got no pain. They're, they're pillars. And see, you need, you need to understand that, that leadership has a price. It's suffering. It's suffering. And I just, I just shared with Kath. I said, Kath, there's a world of difference between concern and worry. And we've got to be focused in on the challenges of the day and to be able to let our worries go and let's give it over to God. And I shared a passage for her to consider. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. He said, well, how did you know to turn to Philippians 4 that, that would deal with the pain? I have to read this passage all the time. <laughs> Let's look at it. Of course, our last point is very simple. The end of pain. Verse 4. Chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice! Can I have an amen on that? Yeah. Now, let's ask yourself a question. Are you fired up this morning? I mean, are you really just excited and fired up and rejoicing? It doesn't say, you know, you have a reason not to be rejoicing. He says, here's my line. Rejoice a little always. He just says, he doesn't say, consider rejoicing. Think about it. Meditate upon it. He says, just do it. Rejoice. He says, let me say it again, because I don't think he got quite it. Rejoice. See, if you would try that right now, you'll feel better anyway. Just go, I am deciding to rejoice. Oh, boy, that feels good. I'm going to obey the word of God. I'm just going to rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. What, what happens when we don't rejoice, when we get worried? We get hard. 
We get angry. You know what I mean? Us guys, we back into the cave. The sisters, they want to come on into the cave to come and get us. You know what I'm talking about? And that's where the, the mama bear meets the papa bear. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. See, this is all about God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, when, when, when a non-Christian bumps into a true disciple, they're blown away by that disciple's joy and their peace and the aura that goes with it. That's just, you know, when you're doing good spiritually, there, there's a, an aura. You know what I'm talking about right there? You can just, you can just feel it. That there, there's, a, there's an aura that's there. And if the aura's gone, it's because we've disconnected from God. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Not the negatives, not the mortgage payment, not the problems, not all the shortcomings of your spouse. You think about what's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. When you're thinking about those things, you're flat fired about your life. And whatever you've learned, received, or heard from me, or seen, put into practice and the God of peace be with you. Hey, put a little discipling in your life. Then here's the kicker. Verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you've renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you've had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or one. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He says, I've, I've been a Christian 25 years. That's what Paul's saying. And I learned something. Now, the encouraging thing is you haven't been a Christian for 25 years. There's hope still. But you've got to learn this. It doesn't come with baptism. You've got to learn this. How to be content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether things are going cranking in your financial life or tanking, <laughs> even whether things are going great inside of your family. He says, Paul says, I have learned to be content. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I think the pain took Jephthah out. He didn't have the hope of Jesus like we do. And for Christians, we face not only the pains of this life that all flesh is heir to, but we even suffer for the name of Jesus. You know, last night as we talked to the Wootens, I just thought about just how, how special it was to, to have someone like Elena married 30 years. And as Marty pointed out, still that awesomely good looking. And I, I had to remind the Wootens of the same thing. How beautiful Kathy is. And though we all have challenges that at times seem overwhelming, that at times seem too much, that at times we just want to just blame our husbands or go into our cave and have no more to do with life, if we would but turn to God and give Him the burden of our lives, that we not only will cope with the pain, we will overcome the pain. Because all pain is for a purpose. As one person says, don't waste your pain. It's to teach you, endure all hardship as discipline from God. Hebrews 12, verse 7. So that you may yield a harvest of righteousness and peace. 
But sadly, the admonition of verse 15, he says, do not let bitterness grow up as a root and cause trouble and defile many. When you have hardship come into your life, you're either going to turn to the Lord and become a better Christian or you're going to retreat from the Lord and become a bitter Christian. Those are your only options. And so, as disciples, our life doesn't have to be short. We can endure all the pain of this life because we know that for this life there is suffering for something greater. And so what is the admonition of a lesson today? As we studied out the tears in Jephthah's life, it's very simple. Number one, the pain of sin, P. Number two, the pain of an eerie past, E. Number three, the pain of a vow, A. Number four, confronting compounding pains, C. And number five, the end of pain, E. Peace. May the Lord be with you. God bless.